Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from The Voice of America. I'm Pete Musto. And I'm Dorothy Gundy. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today, you will hear from Ana Mateo and her special program, Words and Their Stories. Later, Kelly Jean Kelly brings us one part in an ongoing series about America's presidents. But first, the Higher Education Report with help from Lucia Milanig. Almost anywhere in the world, you are likely to find people doing the same thing at eateries and in other public places, on trains and buses, or wherever else you look. More and more people spend their day looking at laptop computers, smartphones, or other personal electronic devices. They are thinking mainly about their electronic devices and not much else. The same can be said about the world of higher education. More and more college students have no problem walking into a classroom and immediately opening their laptops. Others may spend an entire study period with a smartphone in hand. Some people argue that the increasing use of technology can have many helpful effects on society. But recent research suggests that using technology during class time may harm college students' ability to remember and process the subject material they are learning. Arnold Glass is a professor in the School of Arts and Sciences at Rutgers University in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Glass and a student researcher investigated the issue of divided student attention. They reported their findings in July 2018 in the publication Educational Psychology. The study involved 118 Rutgers students who were taking the same upper-level college class in psychology. The students were permitted to use any electronic device as much as they wanted during half of their daily class periods. During the other half, researchers closely watched them to make sure no one was using any technology. The student's academic performance was measured in several ways throughout the semester. The students took a short test every day, longer tests every few weeks, and a final exam covering all the class material. The researchers found that the average daily quiz results showed no evidence of harmful effects from the use of technology. However, the average results of the larger tests and final exam told a different story. They showed that all the students performed poorly on questions covering material taught on days when they were permitted to use technology in the classroom. It did not matter whether or not the students reported that they had actually used a laptop or cell phone on those days. This is by no means the first or largest study to look at this issue. Still, Glass argues that it shows the use of electronic devices in the classroom prevents students from processing information. The students hear what the professor is saying but they might be buying things online or reading unrelated emails at the same time, for example. So they are not thinking deeply about the subject matter as they are hearing it. And that, Glass says, makes it harder for the information to enter their long-term memory. 
even though a few minutes later they know what the professor said, a week later, if you ask them, all they remember is that they were in class a week ago, he told VOA. They no longer remember what the professor said because they eliminated the opportunity. University of Michigan professor Kentaro Toyama says he has seen this problem progressing for years now. Toyama teaches classes on information technology at the university's School of Information. So it was no surprise to him when many students started bringing laptops to his classes about 10 years ago. At first, Toyama thought it was a good idea as it could help students in their note keeping or could quickly provide information during class discussions. But then he started noticing troubling behavior. Students would be looking at their laptop and they would suddenly smile. And it wasn't because there was anything funny happening in the class, Toyama noted. What I realized very quickly was the students were on social media and that's what they were smiling about. And over time, as this increased, I just felt like I no longer had the attention of my students. At that point, Toyama decided to bar students from bringing laptops to his classes. Yet it was not a total ban. His classes often include activities that involve working with technology. So he says he only bans laptops during the lecture part of his classes, where he needs students' full attention. Toyama says the ban is partial because he feels that technology can intensify both good and bad qualities in anyone. He notes that professors can make classes more interesting by using technology to present information in different ways. And there are many students who can listen, process information, and investigate something online to add to discussions all at the same time. But even if technology is helpful to some students, there are times when it needs to be turned off, as it may harm others, he notes. In 2013, researchers at two Canadian universities reported that laptops not only harmed the academic performance of users. Students without computers were also distracted and, as a result, suffered academically. However, Lauren Margello argues that even Toyama's relatively balanced way of dealing with technology represents a limited understanding of the issue. Margello is an assistant professor of learning sciences at Georgia State University in Atlanta. She says there are times in which classroom use of technology is completely unavoidable as with students with disabilities. And in the current job market, students need to be able to develop the skills that will make their divided attention not only possible, but successful. For example, at many modern business meetings, people might be talking, listening, and operating a device all at the same time. So, Marjolo says, Educators need to think about preparing their students to enter this quickly changing workforce. And in doing so, they may have to reconsider that something other than technology is distracting students. Traditional methods of teaching, such as a professor standing and talking in front of a class for an hour, may not be as interesting to today's college students. In fact, the University of Michigan's Center for Research on Teaching and Learning has created a special software program called Lecture Tools. Students can use the program on their personal devices during a given class. It lets them inform the professor of how well they are understanding the course material. 
Designing instruction in a way that gets students to engage with that material more would be a better solution than to ban laptops because technology in general is not the only way that students find to distract themselves in class, said Marjolo. She and Toyama agree that one other way of solving the problem may be technology itself. Special software already exists for online teaching and testing programs. It can be used to observe student activity on a given electronic device and prevent them from opening unrelated pages and programs. At the start of this school year, Purdue University in Indiana announced it would be using similar software in several of its lecture halls. This aims to prevent students from distracting themselves by blocking video services like Netflix. I'm Pete Musto. And I'm Lucia Milanig. Now it's time for Words and Their Stories from VOA Learning English. On this program, we talk about words and expressions in American English. And today, we will talk about defense mechanisms. These are different ways the body reacts to changing conditions to keep it safe. To learn more about defense mechanisms, let's turn to the experts, animals. Many of them are experts at avoiding danger to stay alive. When animals are frightened or feel threatened, they take steps to protect themselves. A monkey runs for the trees. Birds take flight. A turtle sticks its head back into its shell. An armadillo rolls up into a ball. And a skunk releases an unpleasant chemical. The ostrich, not known for its brain power, buries its head in the sand, as if nothing else can see the rest of its huge body. In American English, we also hide our heads in the sand to avoid something unpleasant. But another animal, the opossum, does something even more unusual. It stops moving and pretends to be dead. In opossum, is a somewhat small animal with a long pointed snout. Most have a white face and grayish body. Opossums were one of the first wild animals encountered by white settlers in the English colony of Virginia. The name opossum entered the English language in the early 17th century. It means white dog in the Native American Palatan or Algonquian language. Many people drop the first O in the name and use the term possum instead. A possum plays dead to trick other animals or the person hunting it. The possum hopes that its hunter is not interested in a dead possum, only a live one. Faking death suggests nothing to eat here, just a dead possum. You can go on your way. An opossum playing dead can be, in a way, great theater. If the animal world gave awards for acting, the opossum might win the award for best death scene. However, before we give that acting award, Science may want to weigh in. Scientists explain that opossums are not acting at all. They can't help it. Playing dead is an involuntary reaction to a threat. It is simply the animal's way to protect itself against danger. When it feels threatened, its body plays dead. But why let a few scientific facts change a good expression? We haven't. The fact that possums are not playing or acting at all 
has not changed the way we use the expression playing possum. And you can use this expression in many different situations. For example, we play possum when we lie to avoid something unpleasant. Let's say you have a big test at school, but you did not prepare for it. You may pretend to be sick and stay home. Or you may want to avoid a difficult project at work, so you call in sick. Both are examples of playing possum to avoid work or responsibility. English has a great word that we can also use, feign. When you feign an illness, you are pretending to be sick. If you feign interest, you are pretending to be interested in something. We also use the expression play possum when feigning ignorance. In other words, we pretend not to know something so that we seem in the dark. Again, this is a good way to avoid responsibility. Or we can simply play possum when we want to hide away and avoid other people. We have another expression for this form of playing possum. If I lay low, I don't respond to email, I don't answer my phone, I don't even open my door, I am avoiding the world. Singer Alan Jackson does the same thing in this song, Just Playing Possum. Just playing possum. Playing low. I've got a hundred watts of hurt coming through the speakers of my stereo. I want to see nobody. Nowhere I want to go. Just playing possum. Now, sometimes playing possum is the same as burying your head in the sand, but sometimes it is not. So they are not interchangeable all the time. Like our friend the ostrich, when you bury your head in the sand, you are avoiding a bad reality, something you wish were different. You are not trying to lie or deceive anyone but yourself. It's a way of tuning out life's unpleasant situations. If the daily news upsets you, you may choose to bury your head in the sand and not tune in to any news programs. Another thing to note, we use burying your head in the sand for both serious and lighthearted issues but we usually use playing possum in a lighthearted way. I mean, you have to agree, it does sound much nicer than lying. And that's Words and Their Stories. I'm Ana Mateo. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today we are talking about Martin Van Buren. He was sworn in as the eighth president of the United States in 1837. Van Buren had already been working for the White House for several years. He had been the Secretary of State for President Andrew Jackson and later his vice president. Jackson asked his party, the Democrats, to nominate Van Buren as their presidential candidate in the 1836 election. They agreed, and Van Buren won that election easily. But he did not win the next election, or the next, or the next.
In his inaugural speech in 1837, Van Buren noted that he was the first U.S. president to be born after the American Revolution. He was also the first president who was not from a British family. His ancestors were Dutch. He remains the only president, so far, who did not speak English as his first language. In his inaugural speech, Van Buren predicted better times for Americans. But several days later, an economic crisis struck. The situation put the country in a depression that lasted for the rest of Van Buren's term. It was one reason the president's opponents called him Martin Van Ruin. The depression was not Van Buren's only problem. He also faced a dispute with Britain related to the border between the U.S. and Canada. The conflict nearly turned into war. Historian Joel Silby says, most experts do not think Van Buren was a strong president. However, Silby notes, Van Buren left an important legacy that still operates today. He created the modern U.S. political system. Van Buren's political education began early. His father was a farmer and operated a hotel at a small town in New York State. Lawmakers sometimes visited the hotel. By listening to them, the future president learned about politics. Eventually, Van Buren studied in a law office and became a lawyer. In the first years of his career, he defended farmers who were fighting large plantation owners for their land. As a result, he developed a reputation for helping the common man. Van Buren became a local official, and then a senator, and governor of New York. When he was 24, he married a young woman he had grown up with, but she died of tuberculosis after 12 years, leaving him with four sons. Historian Joel Silby says, although Van Buren did not remarry, he was known as quite charming among the ladies. Van Buren had a gift for politics, that is, developing relationships and forming alliances. Historian Joel Silby says, most people who knew Van Buren liked him. He seemed warm and friendly. He tried to keep his work-related life and social activities separate. It was not unusual to see him exchange handshakes, smiles, and jokes with men who were his political enemies. His ability to make friends became a powerful tool. Before Van Buren, even lawmakers from the same political party operated independently. They had their own beliefs, their own supporters, and their own allies. Van Buren brought them together. First, he identified people who followed the ideas of Thomas Jefferson, support for independent farmers and states' rights. The group had become known as the Democratic Party, although it was in many ways different from the Democratic Party of today. Van Buren organized meetings for Democrats to talk about their political beliefs. He persuaded them to support the same policies, at that time, the policies of Andrew Jackson. Sometimes, Van Buren helped people who supported Jackson's policies. He gave them government jobs. Van Buren also used a series of meetings to choose one presidential candidate for the party. If this process seems clear-cut, it was not at the time. During the election of 1824, for example, a single party had four separate candidates for president, one for each part of the country. Van Buren's system eventually gave rise to the national conventions that major U.S. parties use today to nominate their candidates. Mm -hmm. 
Van Buren also helped create the modern political campaign. In the 1820s, he saw that many state constitutions were lifting some of their voting restrictions. As a result, states were giving more white males the right to vote. Women, and most African-American men, were still largely prohibited from voting. Historian Joel Silby says, Van Buren wanted to bring the new voters into the Democratic Party. He decided to improve on the methods that other smaller groups had used, campaign events, speeches, and organized efforts to bring people to vote on election day. Silby explains that these efforts to persuade and energize voters were new to national politics. Now they are some of the major features of political campaigns. In the election of 1840, Van Buren sought a second term as president. This time, his opponents used Van Buren's political techniques against him. Silby says the new opposition party, called the Whigs, used popular speeches and events to portray Van Buren as a failed president. Crowds shouted, Matty Van is a used up man. In other words, he no longer had any power or effect in government. Critics also made fun of Van Buren's fine looking, even fussy clothes. They portrayed him as a rich, elite candidate. They compared him unfavorably to their candidate, a military hero named William Henry Harrison. Yet it was Van Buren who had come from a poor family and Harrison from a wealthy one. Even so, Van Buren lost the election of 1840. Four years later, Van Buren again sought the presidency. This time, even Andrew Jackson did not support him. Instead, Jackson backed a man who supported the seizure of Texas and expanding slavery, James Polk. But Van Buren did not permit those defeats to stop his political career. He ran again in the presidential election of 1848. This time, Van Buren withdrew from the Democratic Party he had helped build. He ran instead as the candidate of a new anti-slavery party called the Free Soilers. But even Van Buren's political skills could not persuade voters. He did not win a single state. After losing this final presidential election, Van Buren finally retired. He spent time with his children and grandchildren, traveled, and wrote about his life. At 79, he died of heart failure. I'm Kelly Jean Kelly. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Pete Musto. And I'm Dorothy Gundy.